Yeah. So it can come both from geometry or it can come from the Hamiltonian itself. So for example, in the triangular lattices and in Kagome lattices, the geometry itself gives you exactly. frustration. But it's not always like that. Exactly, it's not always like that. So for example, this term, the Kita F interaction, uh, it appears in a honeycomb lattice. So this is a lattice that is bipartite and doesn't have any problems with the geometry, but the frustration is the, the term itself that tries to align a spin in three different directions that are incompatible at the same time. All right, great. So it's already 20 past 10, so we can continue. But before we move to the physics part, I would like to ask you if you had some time to think about which magnetic order corresponds to these three types of constraints in the expectation values. So any thoughts on any of the three? Yeah, there's a specific definition of up. So let's say that up is in the C direction, just for concreteness. So which C directions are uh, perpendicular to the to the plane? Yeah, exactly. C directions are perpendicular to the to the plane. So all right, what about this expectation value? So All right, I see. And do you can you say around which axis do you have this magnetic ordering? Is it along the C axis, along the X axis, along the Y axis, along the C axis? All right. Any other thoughts? So what if you had taken this equal to zero? All right, any other thoughts? All right, so let, let me just answer this third one or the second one. If this condition is fulfilled, the magnetization is contained in the XC plane. So there is no magnetization in the Y plane. And with this constraint, you can have ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic in any direction contained in the XC plane, just because the imaginary part corresponds to the magnetization in the Y plane. So then what about the third one? Which plane is? Yes, perfect. Now, what about the first one? Yeah, in, in any direction. So if you have a non-zero expectation value of this, you can have magnetization in the x direction, in the y direction, of course, also in the c direction, if the other expectation values are non-zero, uh, and you can have either ferromagnetism, anti-ferromagnetism, or any kind of non-collinear magnetic order, or even non-coplanar magnetic order. But the pure z, um? the pure z direction. The, the pure z would be c dagger up, c up. Yeah, but I mean, it would be. Exactly. In pure set, this is going to be exactly zero. Yeah. So essentially, second term tells you that you don't have in the y direction. Third term tells you that you don't have in the x direction. Uh, and the first term equal to zero would be that you don't have nor x nor y. All right, great. So let us now focus on a, let's say, very special type 
of a magne magnetic system that I actually didn't include in the first type of magnetic material that I discussed. That is the case of uh, symmetry breaking and magnetic states in graphene multilayers. So the, the basic idea is that graphene has a, let's say, density of states that has a V shape, right? And according to our Stoner criteria, in principle, if interactions are not extremely strong, way, way stronger than the hopping, we shouldn't have any kind of magnetic ordering. That is, of course, absolutely right for monolayer graphene, where you have a V-shaped density of states. But once you start stacking different layers of graphene, let's say completely aligned, like bilayer, trilayer, or tetralayer, or higher layers, you actually modify this V-shaped density of states, and you get a finite density of states. So let us look just at how the electronic structure looks like when you have uh, different types of graphene multilayers. And let me just mention that this is, of course, something that you are going to do during the exercise session. So both computing the band structures, density of states, and self-consistent symmetry broken states. So here you see the electronic structure of AB stacked graphene, so just a bilayer. And you see that you have a parabolic band. Then for three layers of graphene, that it's called ABC graphene, that it's also known as rhombohedral graphene, you have still something that looks like a parabolic band, but it's actually a cubic band. Uh, and then as you keep putting more and more and more layers, like ABC, 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 and so forth, that this is all rhombohedral graphite, then this parabolic and then cubic, lay, uh, cubic band becomes a nearly flat band. And these flat bands are some states that live in the top layer, mainly and in the bottom layer. And they are also known as uh, drum head states of nodal line semimetal. So you can think that rhombohedral graphite is a special type of topological state that it's known as a nodal line semimetal. And these flat band states are the surface states of that topological state. So now what it's important to note is that in monolayer graphene, we had a Dirac home and that give rise to a uh, V-shaped density of states. But now here we have quite some states at the Fermi energy. Here we have even more states at the Fermi energy. And here we have even more states at the Fermi energy because we have a flat band. So what this actually means is that the more layers you stack together, the flatter your dispersion is, and therefore the more susceptible to electronic interactions your material may become. Uh, and this is, of course, something that you can systematically see by putting more and more layers. So you can start with monolayer with Dirac density of states and just with one state at zero energy. Then here you have more and more and more and more. And you can see that as you put more layers, uh, you get more and more states close to the Fermi energy. So now if you take a very specific uh, structure, so let's say, for example, AB, graphene by layer, which has this density of states, and now you introduce interactions, just local interactions, what you actually observe is that if these interactions are repulsive, a gap opens up in the electronic structure. And again, the reason why this gap opens up is because, well, interactions always want to lower the energy. And in particular, in this case, you obtain an anti-ferromagnetic state. Now, uh, let me mention two things. The first one is that you can do this calculation for any type of graphene multilayer, and you will always find a symmetry broken state with local interaction. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing to note is that uh, many experiments have seen these interaction driven gaps in graphene multilayers. And the third important thing to note is that we are not exactly sure what is the nature of those gaps in experiments. And this is the reason why I have not included these materials in magnetic materials at the very beginning. So for all the materials that I, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, different types of trihalides, multiferroics, quantum spin liquid candidates, and heavy fermions, we have very good reasons to believe that it's some underlying magnetic order there. But in these graphing multilayers, uh, it is really, really hard to be absolutely sure that the gap that you are seeing is coming from magnetic ordering, and it's not coming from a different type of order, such as it's a charge density wave order, or an intervalic coherent order, or some, let's say, layer polarization order. If you put local interactions, you will, of course, get magnetic ordering. If you put other interactions, you can get other type of ordering. So for example, if you start adding uh, attractive interactions, you can also get a gap that it's a superconducting gap, and, and so forth. So what is actually important is that 
these graphene multilayers are very, very susceptible to having electronic instabilities just because they have a very large density of states. And in some cases, if you put the right interactions, they may be magnetic. In other cases, they may be charged density waves or superconducting and so forth. So during the exercise, you can uh, actually try to put different types of interactions and see which different types of symmetry broken states you are getting in these uh, graphing multilayers. Uh, and of course, if you do this with uh, tri-layers, you see something very much similar. So with local Hubbard interactions, in graphing tri-layers, you see that uh, there's a gap opening. It's even a bit bigger than the gap that you observe in bilayers. And this gap, again, is associated to a magnetic ordering in the top and, and bottom layers mainly. All right, great. So now let us move on to the next family of magnetic van der Waals materials. And again, this is a magnetic van der Waals material in which we can experimentally measure magnetization. So we are absolutely sure that there's local magnetism here. And these are multiferroic van der Waals materials. And in particular, we are going to focus on this uh, nickel iodine monolayer. So the basic idea is that in this system, you have, uh, uh, let's say, nickel atoms that sit on a triangular lattice. And first, it's interesting to note that this lattice is frustrated by itself. And then one of the interesting things is that this material develops a spin spiral state. So this is not a ferromagnet. <laughs> It's, of course, also not an anti magnet because it's a frustrated lattice, but it's also not a state with 120 degrees rotation. So it's something in the middle. And the way to characterize this magnetic state is just by defining something that it's called the Q-vector, which essentially tells you in which direction the spin changes and by how much. So it's kind of a way of generating the whole magnetic structure of your two-dimensional material. So this material has magnetic ordering that is just coming from the, uh, let's say, local moments that you have in nickel. But the most interesting thing is that it also has an electric polarization. And now let me mention why this is actually especially interesting. Usually, uh, electronic instabilities often compete, right? So if you put local Havard interactions, you promote magnetism. If you put repulsive uh, or first neighbor interactions, you promote charge density wave ordering, and in certain cases, uh, finite electric polarization. But these two interactions, they compete. And one very simple way of thinking about this is just if you take a minimal model at half filling, let's say a honeycomb lattice, in which you put both attractive, uh, both repulsive interactions within the same orbitals and between the different orbitals. So if you start playing with the different values of the interactions, you can actually get, let's say, a charge density wave state in which you get more electrons in one side than in the other. Or you can get an antiferromagnetic state in which you get spin up in one side and spin down in the other side. In this first case, you break inversion symmetry. In this other case, you break time reversal symmetry. And a multiferroic is something that it's somehow in the middle. It's a system that breaks both time reversal symmetry and inversion symmetry at the electronic state. But just from this simple model, you, you can see that this doesn't seem actually energetically favorable, right? Because if you kind of enforce having simultaneously charge order and magnetic order, you get a system that doesn't have a gap, for example. So from the energetic point of view, you would say that at least this honeycomb lattice model will develop either magnetism or charge density wave, but certainly not both of them, because both of them give rise to a metallic state that has uh, too many states at the Fermi energy, whereas if you choose this one or the other one, you will have a much lower energy. And let me emphasize that this is a very oversimplistic model of why charge order and magnetic order competes, but it essentially illustrates this idea that usually these two orders are competing with each other. So if you have a material that has a, an electric polarization, usually it will not have magnetism and also the other way around. And that is the reason why, uh, let's say we have many ferroelectrics in the two-dimensional uh, Van der Waals world. We have too many magnets in the two-dimensional Van der Waals world, but we don't have so many multiferroics. And multiferroics is actually uh, one of the most interesting fields in, in, material, in material science uh, because it, they were believed to not exist 
uh, not so long ago, and only some years ago, it was discovered that multiprox would actually be stabilized by some very specific mechanisms that allow you to have compatible uh, magnetic and ferroelectric order. So uh, let me just emphasize that for the case of this two-dimensional Van der Waals material, in particular nickel iodine, the mechanism that gives rise to the electric polarization is actually very, very similar to one of the magnetic couplings that we were discussing before. And in particular, you remember before that we were uh, talking about this um, anti-symmetric exchange, this exchange that somehow promoted magnetization at 90 degrees. You can think that somehow that uh, very same mechanism is here in some form, right? Because if you have a spin spiral, you also have kind of magnetization that it's not parallel or anti-parallel, uh, but it actually has some, let's say, component of a 90 degree rotation. Now, the idea here is that this uh, spin spiral, it's not promoted by, let's say, this anti-formagnetic, uh, by this anti-symmetric exchange, by the anosiski moriya interaction, but it's promoted just by exchange coupling. So if you include both, uh, let's say, first neighbor exchange coupling, second neighbor and third neighbor, you can stabilize many different types of spin spirals. Um, but some, somehow this anti-symmetric exchange, uh, anti-symmetric exchange may appear here. And the way in which it appears here is actually not as the driving force of the non-collinear magnetism, but as a consequence of the non-collinear magnetism. So you can think that anti-symmetric exchange that it's related with uh, broken inversion symmetry drives non-collinear magnetism. But if you have non-collinear magnetism, you can also have the inverse effect that the non-collinear magnetism drives an inverse anti-symmetric exchange. And this inverse anti-symmetric exchange gener generates a broken inversion symmetry. So this is actually the idea in this material. So you have a magnetic structure that has a certain chirality, that it's non-collinear. This non-collinearity generates an inverse anti-symmetric exchange. This inverse anti-symmetric exchange breaks inversion symmetry. So this is kind of the inverse effect to the coupling or, or in comparison with the coupling that, that we discussed before. And in terms of the spin spiral, it can actually be written in this way. So again, the anti-symmetric exchange dependent on spin orbit coupling. So the inverse effect must also depend on spin orbit coupling. So there's a, a prefactor here that it's uh, essentially controlled by the spin orbit coupling of the material, and in particular, the spin orbit coupling of the halide. And then we uh, need to take the wave vector of the spin spiral. Again, is the vector that tells you by how much your spin rotate and in which direction in real space. And then we can need to take what is the spin rotation axis of the spin spiral, which for this spin spiral is just a vector that it's perpendicular uh, to the screen, right? So it's just the rotation axis of your spin spiral. So this is just one different way of writing the DRC scheme more yeah, interaction in particular. Yeah. In multiple cases, the spin spiral has been Yes, that, that's a wonderful question. And actually, you, you can see it directly from this formula. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that you have a Q vector that is parallel to your rotation axis, then this is zero. Mm -hmm. So, so non-collinear magnetization alone is not enough. It needs to be non-collinear magnetization in the right plane, changing in the right direction. So let's say for this material, the Q vector is in the two-dimensional plane and the rotation axis is perpendicular to the plane. But for example, if you have a rotation axis that is in the same direction as you as your q vector, then you, you cannot see anything. Uh, and then, of course, this also depends on the spin orbit coupling of your material. This is the, this prefactor here. So uh, the a very similar prefactor appears in the Nyasovsky Moria interaction and in this inverse Nyasovsky Moria interaction. And the idea is that if you have materials that are relatively light, 
uh, like a material that has, uh, for example, just uh, oxygen or, or sulfur, uh, then the spin orbit coupling is going to be very, very small. And actually, the, usually the spin orbit coupling of the magnetic uh, atoms is very, very small. In the case of, let's say, chromium or, or nickel, usually it, it doesn't matter at all for this type of, um, let's say, inverter system or the interaction and the spin orbit coupling that matters is of the heaviest atom that you have in, the, in your material. Oh, this is the intrinsic spin orbit coupling. Oh, so it's not. Strength. Yeah, it's the strength. It's the atomic spin orbit yeah, coupling. Uh, related question is: Does this actually fix the sign of the field? So is it just that the, it tells in which direction the polarization is here? Uh, but is the sign of field still a spontaneous problem, or is it uh, so, is it kind of already? Uh, following the, the position in the magnetic yeah so so it's fixed by by this formula so there's no symmetry breaking in the in the sign of of the electropolarization and of course this guy here can either be positive or negative so the, this is not and just it's a bias for the electropolarization. yes exactly exactly so the, there's a one to one relation between your magnetic structure and your electric polarization so they are coupled yeah. actually if you change one the other also changes yeah. Okay, but but the magnetic structure kind of has a foundation. Exactly. So so in this sense, okay, so uh, but so there's what, no extra. So, so what happens if I mean the material satisfies all the two conditions, the spin orientation and the causes the charge, but it has the less, you know, it's lighter elements. Yeah. But what you can do is you can you can approximate right? you know the coupling from different materials. To supply is that work for me? Um, I mean that, that's a very good question. I, I would say that in that case, it may be challenging to make it work because this spin orbit coupling is actually internal in, in the atom. So it's actually the intrinsic spin orbit coupling within the atom, and not so much uh, let's say some rush for spin orbit coupling that you apply externally. And I mean, of course, rush for spin orbit coupling is a consequence of the internal spin orbit coupling times hopping. But when you proximatize things, you affect the rush by, uh, let's spin orbit coupling, but not the internal one of each element. And this parameter here depends on the internal one. What may actually work uh, is that, uh, let's say, your magnetic structure may be sensitive to anything that you put nearby your material, right? So if you put your material in a, on a different substrate, it may happen that the wave vector of the spin spiral changes and it changes in the right way so that your multiferocity increases. And there's this thing called uh, interpersonal asthma where, where you can kind of, where there is kind of a proximity effect. Yeah. 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 I guess. What's the starting point to choose? Uh, well, we have the uh, organizers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please uh, interrupt us. Yeah. Uh, tell us yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the uh, like connecting people to all this. So basically, uh, I can imagine a system, especially in B, where the spin orbit coupling is actually human. So is it possible actually to tune this coupling between magnetization and polarization on and off in a system just by Whatever. So, so if you were capable of uh, controlling the spin, the internal spin orbit coupling, then yes, let's say. So, uh, for example, if you think about a two D magnet that you alloy, namely that you replace, let's say, uh, let's say iodine by bromide or by chlorine and so forth, so the different atoms, then that is going to certainly affect this prefactor because you are going to change the spin orbit coupling. It may also affect a little, a little bit the, the Q vector because your electronic structure changes a bit. But yes, that, that would be, of course, absolutely possible. Still it's an atomic spin orbit coupling. Exactly, it's the atomic spin orbit coupling. So not so much the, uh, you, can influ you, you cannot influence it so much externally. Yeah. So externally, it, it is much easier to influence the Q vector rather than, than this prefactor. But influencing the Q vector may be already very important, right? Because nothing tells you that you have the optimal Q vector, right? All right, great, wonderful. So this is essentially the idea 
of multiferocity in nickel ion. So it's the inverse effect uh, with the biasiski morija interaction. All right, great. So now let us move on to excitations into, into the magnets. And in particular, we are going to focus on magnums that are fluctuations that appear both in ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, and multiferroics. So the basic idea is that you can think about any 2D magnetic material that has a finite magnetic ordering, let's say in the C direction. And now you can start thinking about how your system depends on fluctuations of this order parameter, and in particular, how important these fluctuations are and whether they have some specific dynamics. So in terms of a sketch, you can think that when you have an excitation in a ferromagnet, what actually happens is that the magnetization in each side changes a little bit. And if this change is small enough, you can think that it's going to cost an arbitrarily small amount of energy. And this type of fluctuation is usually what we call a magnum, at least a classical magnum. So now what we are going to do is we are going to see how to derive a Hamiltonian for magnums starting from the Heisenberg model for a two-dimensional van der Waals magnet. So we will start with a Hamiltonian like this. It can be ferromagnetic, it can be anti-ferromagnetic. Let's take it ferromagnetic for concreteness. And what we are going to do is we are going to assume that uh, each spin, uh, in each side we have a spin. And uh, the spin can be one half, one, three halves, two, five halves, and, and so forth, depending on what is the filling of the d orbital that we have in, in our manifold. Then, for example, uh, for several, uh, 2D magnets, such as uh, chromium iodine, chromium bromine, chromium chlorine, and the relevant case is uh, spin three halves. So now the basic idea is that we just want to make a transformation in this Hamiltonian to see what are the fluctuations. And the idea is fairly simple. So we start with the Hamiltonian and we start with the ground state. So we assume that we do know the ground state and our ground state is just a state in which all the spins point up. And all these spins are, let's say, for example, spin three half. So we have a ground state that it's spin three half. So this is a product state. This is effectively a classical state that breaks time reversal symmetry with magnetization in the C direction. So now the basic idea is just to do a mathematical transformation in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And the idea is that uh, you start with a Hamiltonian with spin operators and you transform it into a Hamiltonian with different operators. And let me emphasize that this is something that we have already done in some form before, right? So at the beginning of the session, we started with a Hamiltonian for electrons, and then we made a transformation and we went to a Hamiltonian for spins. So now we are just going to make this a step again, but in slightly different form. And now what we are going to do is we are going from a Hamiltonian uh, written for spins to a Hamiltonian written for bosons, and in particular, for magnums. And the only trick here is to do this type of transformation. And uh, of course, uh, this looks a little bit intimidating, but let me walk, through, walk you through it. So first of all, this is uh, an exact algebraic transformation between spin operators and bosonic operators. So you essentially have the latter operators, this plus and minus, which are Sx plus minus Sy you can write them exactly, mathematically exactly, in terms of this bosonic operators, where A are just bosonic operators. Now, the basic idea is that if you have a ferromagnetic system, uh, this kind of transformation becomes much easier to understand. So first of all, if you have a ferromagnet, what you actually would say is that your total magnetization is essentially the total spin, right? So what this actually means is that this expectation value is much smaller than the spin, and it's even zero. So let's take this expectation value zero from now on. So S set is just S minus this, that when we take expectation value, it's going to be very small. And now if we think uh, uh, about these terms here, the term that it's on the square root can be simplified if we make essentially this assumption. So the term here inside, we take it at zero, the term here inside, we take it as zero, and S plus is essentially A, S minus is essentially A dagger with a certain prefactor, and that's all. And of course, this is a simplification that we can make when we assume that we have a ferromagnet, or when we assume that we have ferromagnet. 
if we had a system that does not break the universal symmetry, then this would not work, of course, because this simply uh, this assumption would completely break down. So the basic idea is that if S plus is A and S minus is a dagger, then if you plug all these S plus and S minus inside your Heisenberg Hamiltonian, you directly go to a Hamiltonian that is quadratic in this uh, bosonic operators, and that in particular has creation and annihilation operators, and that it has a uh, several prefactors. And these prefactors, of course, depend on J, I, J, and you have square root of 2S and, and so forth. And maybe you just remind what is S plus and S minus instead. Oh. Yes, so S plus and S minus are related with S X and S Y. Let's see. Yeah, so this is essentially the idea. So they are kind of the ladder operator. So they essentially increase your spin or decrease your spin. So. Oh, what is, the, so what is the relation between the original J and the new gamma? So that, that's a very good question. The idea is that uh, gammas are propor linearly proportional to J. And then, of course, they have also these prefactors. This is at zero temperature. If you are at finite temperature, then you will need to do a full mean field calculation of, uh, let's say, all these operators. And at finite temperature, then your gammas would not be just linearly dependent on J, but they would have a non-linear dependence on J and on, on, a non-linear dependence on your temperature. And essentially, as you go to higher and higher temperatures, your gammas become smaller and smaller just from a mean field treatment. But at zero temperature, they are just proportional to J. All right, great. So that, that was essentially the idea. So uh, as, um, the, essentially the, the trick to transform from spin operators to bosonic operators is to do this, this type of replacement in the Hamiltonian. S plus becomes A, S minus becomes A dagger, and then S set is just the total spin minus uh, the occupation number. And now the idea is that this has a very, very simple in interpretation from the physical point of view. So S plus is essentially the state that kind of increases the magnetization of, uh, of your system. And if your magnetization is already maximal, it, it doesn't do anything. It does something if your magnetization is smaller. Then S minus decreases the magnetization of your system. So you may think that you start from the maximal magnetization, then you apply S minus. And when you apply S minus, you lower the magnetization of your system and you create a quasi particle. So essentially, the interpretation of S minus is that S minus is the creation operator of a quasi particle, of a bosonic quasi particle that we call a magnon. So, in other words, the more magnons you have in a two dimensional magnet, the lower your magnetization is. And the less magnons you have, the higher your magnetization is. And that is, of course, something that you can directly read from the total expectation value of your magnetization. So the total expectation value is the maximal spin of your system that can be three halves, for example, minus the number of magnons. So you, if you have zero magnons, you have the maximal magnetization that you can have. If you have a finite number of magnons, then your magnetization is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, great. So essentially, now we know that in 2D magnets, we have magnons, and the more magnons we have, the smaller our magnetization is. So now the interesting thing to note is that magnons are just one new type of quasi-particle. They, they have a Hamiltonian that it's uh, bilinear. And as a bilinear Hamiltonian, it's a Hamiltonian that, that we can exactly solve and we can exactly diagonalize. And in particular, if we start from real space, we can, let's say, very easily go to momentum space for our quasi-particles and see that uh, magnons are also going to have a dispersion in, uh, in momentum space. And let, let me emphasize that we'll, as we go from this point to this point, we are doing exactly this very same trick as we did with electrons. In principle, there's no difference uh, to diagonalize a Hamiltonian for electrons from a Hamiltonian for magnons. 
One of them are fermions, the other one are bosons, but for this step, they work exactly in the same way. So the basic idea is that now magnons, these excitations in magnets, they can have their own electronic structures and their own band structures. So we can have magnons that have a parabolic dispersion and that they, uh, the minimum magnon appears at zero energy. We can have uh, dispersions of magnons that have a finite gap, or we can even have Dirac magnons. So magnons that are governed by a Dirac equation. And let me emphasize that this spectra is what appears in uh, in in-plane magnets. This is the spectra of magnons that you get in uh, 2D magnets that have out-of-plane magnetization. And this is the spectra that you get for antiferromagnets. So uh, direct magnons appear in uh, antiferromagnetic magnetic systems. All right, great. So now let us uh, address something that is actually extremely important for 2D magnetism that somehow we've been ignoring so far. So in all the calculations and all the ground states that we've been discussing so far, we assumed that there was symmetry breaking, right? That was an assumption for us. It was an assumption when we do mean field. It was an assumption even when we took our Heisenberg models. But now that we know how the fluctuations behave, it is important to see if these symmetry broken states are actually uh, robust with respect to the fluctuations or whether if these fluctuations are going to completely des destroy the symmetry broken states. And for that, let us just focus on a very a specific model. So we are going to take our Heisenberg model with the exchange coupling. Uh, and then we are going to take our Heisenberg model with exchange coupling that it's also paramagnetic, but now that it also has an, um, an isotropic exchange. So the basic idea is that this Hamiltonian is rotationally symmetric. This spin Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian that you have in the absence of spin orbit coupling, because in the absence of spin orbit coupling, the Hamiltonian must be rotationally symmetric. This Hamiltonian on the right is the Hamiltonian that you may have if you have strong spin orbit coupling interactions in your material, and in particular, if they promote uh, this term that it's a, an isotropic exchange. Now, if you do this uh, holstein primakov transformation to go from the uh, spin Hamiltonian to the bosonic Hamiltonian, in both cases, what you actually observe is that for this Hamiltonian, you get gapless magnums. For this Hamiltonian, you get magnums that have a gap in the dispersion, namely, that the lowest energy magnum has a finite positive energy, namely that you need to pay some finite energy to create a magnum. All right, so now let, let's look at how our symmetry broken changes according to this. So we had that the uh, S set operator was in, in terms of the bosonic operator was the total spin minus the number of magnums, right? Minus the occupation number of magnums. So we can essentially compute what is the correction to the magnetization due to a finite number of magnums. And this correction to the magnetization is just the number of magnums that you have, right? The more magnums you have, the lower your magnetization is. So now the basic idea is that if you compute what is this correction to the magnetization, uh, just by taking into account that at low energies, your magnums are quadratic and that they are bosons, so you include the uh, Bose-Einstein di distribution, what you actually get is that the correction to the magnetization takes an approximate form that is this one. So here, delta is the gap that you have with respect to lowest energy, and this k square is just the parabolic dispersion, and kdk is just the, the phase space around the gamma point. And then you integrate this up to a certain uh, cutoff. That this is, let's say, very similar to the divide frequency, but for magnons. Now, if you look at this integral, you may know really something very interesting, which is that if you take delta equal to zero, if you take that there's no gap whatsoever, this integral diverges. And it diverges exactly because of the k equal to zero part, right? So this is a logarithmic divergence, but it's a divergence still. And if you take any delta different from zero, uh, this is absolutely okay because this is a finite number, right? So the bottom line is that if you don't have any magnum gap at all, the correction to the magnetization becomes infinite at any finite temperature. What this actually means is that your assumption that this was a small number 
completely breaks down because infinite is not a small number, of course. And this happens at any finite temperature. So the bottom line is that this magnum gap essentially controls what is the critical temperature of your material. And let me emphasize that there, let's say the functional form is not simple, but essentially this sets up the energy scale at which you get magnetic ordering. So in other words, magnums, and in particular, the dispersion of magnums control what is the critical temperature of your two-dimensional van der Waals material. And uh, they also uh, control, let's say, how many magnums you are going to have at a certain temperature. So this, this statement depends on dimensionality, uh, uh, because uh, for 3D you would have k squared in the... Yes, uh, exactly. So the dimensionality appears exactly here. So, and then, uh, but then also uh, on magnum dispersion in the sense that uh, oh yes, absolutely. But so for the <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good point. So for Dirac magnons, you would think that instead of having k square here, you have k. So you would say, oh, that's okay, right? Because this integral converges for Dirac magnons. That's actually not true because there for Dirac magnons, there's a form factor here, and once you include that form factor, you recover the divergence. So for Dirac magnons, you have to do this in a little bit more careful way. You cannot just matrix element. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's a, a matrix element here that appears for anti-ferromagnets, but not for, for ferromagnets. So and you can of course do this even for a non-collinear magnet. And if you do this for any kind of non-collinear magnetic structure, you essentially recover always the same result. That if you don't have an isotropy, the number of magnons that you have is infinite at any finite temperature. But of course, let's say the easiest case to, to see is the ferromagnetic case. And this is one specific example of something called Mervyn Wagner theorem that essentially tells you that if you have a Hamiltonian that's rotationally symmetric, then you cannot have order at finite temperature, or you cannot break a continuous symmetry at finite temperature, let's say. All right, great. So this argument is very, very important for several 2D magnets, and in particular for uh, out-of-plane magnets, in particular chromium bromide, chromium iodine, and many others. Now, of course, you, you may think, well, hold on, there are also in-plane magnets, right? So there are magnets that have in-plane magnetization, right? And if you have in-plane magnetization, you still have a rotation. How is that you have magnetism with in-plane magnetization if you are kind of violating mermin Wagner's theorem? That is a very good question. And the answer to that is that when you have in-plane magnetization, mermin Wagner theorem actually breaks down because mermin Wagner theorem assumes that you have local interactions, that you have interactions that are local in space and that they decay very quickly as you go far from it. But if you have in-plane magnetism, then you have dipolar interactions. And dipolar interactions have a very, very long tail. And actually what dipolar interactions do is to uh, kind of very much decrease your density of states here. And if you do it carefully, you will see that with this very much decreased density of states, you get a finite correction to the magnetization. So dipolar interactions are the responsible ones for stabilizing in-plane magnetism, in particular in chromium chloride, whereas for out-of-plane magnets, magnetic anisotropy is the one that is responsible. So for out-of-plane magnets, Spin orbit coupling is the energy scale that determines uh, your uh, critical temperature because spin orbit coupling is the term that determines this value of K. Whereas if you have implant magnetism, spin orbit coupling doesn't matter so much because dipolar interactions don't have any dependence on spin orbit coupling. Uh, hold on. Uh, the concept of implant versus out of plane already assumes an Yes, yes, it, it depends on which value of k so, you take here. So first you have an anisotropy and then you determine whether that anisotropy is out of plane, right? And e, that's the other way around. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you can... If you have an out of plane magnet, you know that there's an anisotropy. And you cannot say that there's an out of plane magnet without an anisotropy. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's an anisotropy, of course, all, all, all the time. So what I'm... All right, so let, let me rephrase that statement. So, of course, in any material, you are going to have a term like this, and this term may promote out-of-flame magnetism or in-plane magnetism. If it is bigger than zero, 
it promotes out of plane magnetism. If it is smaller than zero, it promotes in plane magnetism. And this is just a statement about the sign. Positive sign, out of plane, negative sign, in plane. Now, if you have positive sign and you are out of plane, then the magnitude of this term determines the, your critical temperature. So for positive sign, the magnitude matters. For negative sign, the magnitude doesn't matter because what stabilizes magnetism is now dipolar interactions. So I think that that's the right way of phrasing it. Yeah, yeah thanks. That was a very, very good point. All right, great, wonderful. So uh, now the, the last point that I wanted to mention is that, of course, magnons uh, have dispersions. And, and dispersions can be, let's say, trivial, can be topological, right? So yesterday, we saw that some superconductors had excitations, others uh, excitations on the edges, others didn't. And the ones that did were topological, the, the ones that didn't were non-topological superconductors. So for magnons, we can have very much the very same phenomenology. And in particular, we can have systems that have topological magnons. So in particular, if you take a monolayer of a ferromagnet that has a Gerhardt scheme or a interaction from putting it on a surface. So for example, you take chromium bromide or chromium iodine and you put it on a surface, then that Gerhardt you know, scheme or interaction actually opens up a topological gap in your magnum spectra. Oh, it's a, at high a, at high energies essentially. So, of course, your magnum spectra has a gap, right? Because you need to have a finite gap in your in your magnons, and then if you go at high energies, so so the so for chromium bromide or iodine, those energies would be on the order of fifteen MeV or ten MeV above the magnum. Okay. In, in, right inside the magnum gap, right in the middle of the magnum band, oh. let's say. So for, let's say, magnum band structures, you can also have, let's say, topological excitation. You can have, have topological magnons. Uh, and in particular, in some van der Waals magnets, there have been some signatures of these topological magnons that appear there. Uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, hard to know if you have topological magnons or, or not, because you need to measure the topological magnetic excitations on the edges, which is, of course, challenging. But this is certainly something that can appear in two-dimensional magnets. And what is most important is something that you can engineer by putting different 2D magnets on top of different materials. So as you put different 2D magnets on top of different materials, you are breaking inversion symmetry in many different ways. And these many different ways can give rise to different types of um, um, yeah, anti-symmetric exchange, and the anti-symmetric exchange is essentially what governs this topological gap. Uh, yes. <laughs> how how do I move my? I, I think it's connected to that question. What's my point of magnetic direction? How can I move it? Yeah, that's a very good point. So, in principle, you can't. Let's say the the magnetic chemical potential is at zero. Let's say. Um, I mean, you, one can say that you can move it if you apply a magnetic field in the opposite direction of your magnetization. The, the trick is that, um, I mean, th these are not uh, fermions. They have, these are bosons, right? And you don't want to have negative energy states for bosons, because if you have negative energy states for bosons, then you, they are completely populated, right? Uh, and if they are completely populated, they, they kill your magnetization. So, so, I mean, technically, if you apply a magnetic field in the opposite direction as your magnetization, you start pulling these magnum bonds down in energy, and eventually they could go to negative energies. But, but of course, from the physical point of view, if you have an out-of-plane magnet and you start applying magnetic field in the opposite direction, eventually the magnet is just going to switch, right? That is just a consequence of your magnets going in the opposite direction. So in principle, it is not easy to change the chemical potential. Yeah, how can you see them, right? Yes, that, that's a wonderful question. So the uh, the point is that topological magnums are not a property of the, the ground state, but they are a property of the excitations of the system. So for example, you could excite this 
with, uh, with let's say, light as, at a certain frequency with with microwaves. And if you pick the right frequency, you will essentially excite the magnum right in this frequency range here. Yeah, Ex exactly. That, that's the point. You excite to, to that state, but you don't have a Fermi C and you cannot put your chemical potential over there because th these are bosons. These are no longer fermions. Yeah, yeah, that was a wonderful point. I mean, you would see some signature, but it's going to be very, very, very weak. So, so the idea. Exactly. So the idea is that if you're at low temperatures, all the magnons that matter are here, very close to, to zero energy. And I mean, of course, it matters a little bit if you have magnons a little bit at high energies, and you can claim, well, look, in the bulk, all my magnons, most of my magnons are here in the edge, most of my magnons are there, and I may get a little bit from the tail in my measurements, but it's going to be an extremely subtle effect. Uh, so it's going to be pretty hard to, to see. I, I would say that the most direct way of seeing these magnons is just by exciting your system at the right frequency. And if, and if you do that, you can just insert a magnetic fluctuation in, in this band if you excite at that frequency. For example, in this case, you can do the tunneling. When you look at the ages, and if it's there, according to this, it looks like there will be some helical ions. Uh, yes. Yeah, with with tunneling, this would work with, yeah. because with tunneling you are inserting excitations at a finite energy. Yeah. And then because the helical, then I have if I apply magnetic fields, a certain field, this helical state will disappear, right? Because these so, guys are opposite. So oh, the, this is actually this is a chiral. So uh, yeah. red. Yeah, but uh, but let's say um, red is the top edge. Blue is the bottom edge, so it's chiral states. Yeah. So I mean, the, the color code here is that red means the top edge, blue means the means the bottom edge. Yeah. So so essentially, magnons in one edge propagate all in one direction. Magnons on the other edge propagate all in the opposite direction. In pre in principle, yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. All right, great. So I think that this is a very good time to make a short break of, let's say, 15 minutes. And for the break, I would like to ask you something that we briefly discussed before. So from these three electronic structures, which one you think that is the most susceptible one to electronic interactions? And of course, let's say you can also just get somewhere now. So yeah, see you in 15 minutes at half past 11.